to some extent, the inquiry of the researcher is into the research filtering and the tools and research and search techniques really can't be separated. As such, the pre-search filtering and the choice of tools and techniques are multidimensional and cannot be separated. In this lesson, we will narrow the discussion of these points to the world of Westlaw Next and align the concepts covered in the textbook to Westlaw Next. In other words, we're going to take these points in this introductory slide, the multidimensional nature of the pre-search filtering and choosing your tools and search techniques, as well as the considerations in selecting a research tool and the search techniques available, the Westlaw Next tools and techniques. Um, we bring this discussion into the Westlaw world so that you can, we're aligning these concepts with Westlaw. Uh, to some extent, the inquiry of the researcher into the pre-search filtering and the tools and search techniques can't be separated, as I already noted. So the pre-search filtering and the choice of tools, not to repeat myself, but to you know, ground you in what I'm talking about. So the pre-search filtering and the choice of tools and techniques being multidimensional, yet simultaneously um, considered, you know, you can't separate the two. So there's a great deal of overlap between chapter four and chapter five of this textbook. And so we're going to revisit the pre-search filtering matrix, if you will, from the Sloan book. So let's take a look at it on the next slide. As previously noted, there is an overlap between chapter four and chapter five. And this slide, I hope, illustrates a portion of the matrix from Sloan's book. If you want to compare this matrix on this slide with your book, go ahead and turn to page 32. What I've done here is I've taken that matrix and I've carved out of it. I'm talking about the matrix on page 32. I've carved out of it just the battery tort claim so I can focus your attention on the research question we're working on. And that question is, did the neighbor commit the tort of battery by purposely blowing smoke in the client's face? So what I've done is I've uh, let's see if I get this okay. So what I've done is I've uh, used the same uh, concepts that were in the uh, search tool that the the search matrix that we used for the previous module or the previous lecture, and I've added in bold and italics the points from that matrix on page 32 that apply only to the tort of uh, smoker and battery. Okay, so in the controlling jurisdiction based on the case scenario is North Carolina. And the author on page 32 notes the obvious, the events occurred in North Carolina. So the answer to the question, where did the event occur is here in italics. The degree of confidence that the researcher, the, the mock researcher has in uh, determining this is high. And the search strategy is to search for North Carolina authority. Because the jurisdiction is North Carolina, that's based on the events that occurred in North Carolina. The degree of confidence is high, and so we're obviously going to look for uh, the con for resources, search resources, in North Carolina with North Carolina authority. The subject area is torts. And we reach that conclusion because we ask this, uh, ourselves the question, what legal subject controls the event? Battery is a tort. It's also a crime, but we're being careful to focus anytime we're dealing with this particular case on tort. The degree of confidence with regard to the answer to that question is high. So I'm not questioning when I'm a researcher that battery is a tort. I'm certain I've got a really high degree of confidence that battery is a tort. And then here, 
Um, you know, originally we had you know search resources that publish information in the applicable subject area of law. So of course, I'm drawn to what I need to do is search for information on torts, specifically battery as a tort. So I'm not going to be looking for information on crimes, specifically battery as a crime. I'm going to be looking for information on torts, specifically battery as a tort. Here, the type of authority. And remember, in the previous slide, we looked at the type of authority as being cases or statutes or regulations. Uh, so the type of authority is what is the legal source that we would consult? And the basis for filtering is you know, what information source we ask ourselves in pre-filtering. What information source is likely to have the rules needed uh, to solve the problem? So again, this will depend on the area of law and the types of authority typically consulted in this area of law. So the researcher answers the question, torts is an area of law frequently developed through common law rules. The degree of confidence here is medium. Again, there might be some uh, uh, common law rules that are uh, in statutes. Remember my mentioning that sometimes uh, statutes reflect common law principles or in derogation of common law by the way so meaning that wow the legislature doesn't like the common law rule so we're going to change it to the, um, the the common law rule that goes into the legislation that we we want. Uh, decide and then the, so that's the degree of confidence, medium. And decide if this, the next step here is decide if secondary authority is needed first to understand the rules that apply. So here we're going to confirm our degree of confidence, confirm that common law rules apply, and get an overview of relevant legal principles. Search for cases if it's appropriate. So now we have a search strategy that's based on you know the degree of confidence all of these holds you know steady this was our decision making in this column how are we what is our basis for this what's our rationale for it and here we decide the degree of confidence so now we have a, a search strategy here in this column of what we're going to look for what where we're going to look for it so right now we're looking for the bookshelf or the database we're not looking for the answer yet. This is the strategy on where do I go from here. So now let's look at the same Sloan matrix again. Now I've deleted the degree of confidence column. It doesn't matter for this conversation at this point because now we want to develop a strategy through the lens of what available research tools are available and as I pointed out, when I started the lecture, I wanted to make sure I'm aligning this with Le with Lex. I'm sorry, with Westlaw Next, because that's the tool we're mostly using in this class. So nothing has changed. You're still in the north. Or we're still in North Carolina. We're still in torts. We're still looking for um, the medium degree of uh, confidence in cases. <coughs> And here's our research strategy. Nothing has changed here. I left these here just so you can see how these two um, decisions relate to what research tools I'm going to use. So I stopped and I thought about uh, the research strategy. I need to find resources in, in the controlling jurisdiction, which is North Carolina. And so therefore, I need to find legal authority or rules in North Carolina so that I have binding primary authority. Westlaw Next, then I look into Westlaw Next, what does it have to offer me as a research tool? Well, it allows me to search North Carolina authority, authority, for example, statutes, cases, rules and regulations that are primary authority in North Carolina. So I'm likely to find something controlling that binds, uh, that, that would bind a court in my jurisdiction, if I'm assuming I live in, I'm in the, working in the jurisdiction of North Carolina. Okay? 
So the subject area of torts comes along as a pre-search filtering criteria, just like the controlling jurisdiction. And you know we've already performed this step of what sources publish information in the applicable subject area of law. So we want to find info on torts, specifically battery as a tort. So I think, what does Westlaw next have for me as far as a research tool in terms of torts and specifically battery as a tort? Well, fortunately, Westlaw Next has databases for both primary and secondary authority, and they have it for many jurisdictions. And I point out when I say jurisdictions in the form of many, they have many state jurisdictional databases, actually all the states. Or I can filter it down just to North Carolina. That's nice because, again, my jurisdiction is North Carolina, and my goal as always, is to find binding authority in the controlling jurisdiction. So I can start narrowly with North Carolina, and I could broaden my research to include other states if that's needed. And I can also narrow the search to the subject area of torts. So I, I'm a proponent of starting narrow, and I think pre-filtering, pre-search filtering does this naturally. But one of the natural steps of going narrow, uh, of pre-filtering, would be to stay within my own jurisdiction, so start narrowly, and then broaden only if I need to find persuasive uh, authority from another state. And I can also recognize that in my research tools, if there, uh, I need to look for, uh, to search the subject area of torts. So I'm not going to go into criminal law to find this information. I'm going to find research tools in Westlaw Next or use research tools in Westlaw Next that cover the subject area of torts. Down to the last row, the type of authority, cases. All right, now we've made this decision. Confer we need to confirm though that common law rules apply and get an overview of relevant legal principles. So search for cases, if appropriate. Well, I come over here and I say, what research tools in my thought process do I know are going to help me with this confirmation that I need? Well, Westlaw Next has both secondary and primary authority databases. I need to focus my initial research on secondary sources to confirm that common law rules apply and to get an overview of the relevant legal principles. Then search by source for cases if appropriate. So this is my, well, this is my research strategy. The research tools are what help me meet that research strategy. Returning to one of the overlaps of chapter four and chapter five, I uh, felt inclined to uh, show you from chapter four this um, this figure 4.1 from page uh, 28 of the textbook. This figure illustrates pre-filtering and pre-filtering as demonstrated on the previous slide. Remember the previous slide was thinking carefully about our research question to figure out which sources are most likely to contain the relevant information that I need. Primary binding authority, right? Um, and so if you look at this chart, this, this pyramid that the author has put together, this is another way of illustrating what you are accomplishing when you use the pre-search filtering. Here in this world there is all legal information. Every byte of information out there in the information universe. And when I pre-filter by relevant criteria, I search for specific content and filter my search by relevant criteria, I evaluate the results. And so what you need to see here is that you know I'm spending some time here in pre-filtering by relevant criteria. 
as in what sources are going to are going to be there to help me find the answer to this to, to this um, question. And then I search for the specific content. So working downward, I search for the specific content using my search engine or using my Westlaw Next um, account after I've pre-filtered. And then I filter the search by relevant criteria and evaluate my results. So the relevant criteria is, is, this, um, is this an applicable, um, is, is what I have found um, a subject matter wise or um, by type of authority, etc. I have my filtered search that has relevant criteria. And then I evaluate the search re results and I finally reach this point of finding the information that I'm looking for. As compared to the next slide, this slide shows all legal information again, just like the last slide did, the universe of all legal information. And instead of, with, and without pre-filtering, which was shown on the previous slide is the first step at the top, your research activity looks more like this, which is a post-search filtering only model that's also illustrated in figure 4.1 of the textbook. As you can see, when the relevant criteria um, decided on you know, pre-filtering by sources most likely contains relevant information, I end up with fewer results in the first place, presumably, if I, I pre-filter by source, sources. And that permits me to spend less time filtering the research results by the source of criteria. So technically, we're spending more time filtering our search results by relevant criteria instead of with the initial um, criteria being made in the first place. The next slide will we'll compare the two to make a little bit more sense of this. So here it is. As you can see, when we pre-filter by relevant criteria, we go straight, we, we have less content to dig through or to evaluate, excuse me. So we're filtering all the time. Even after we search for the specific content, we still have to filter more in a pre-search uh, uh, criteria type of way. When we use this, I'm saying, I'm saying when we use this format, we're still filtering and filtering into the, to the point where we can evaluate our research results. But here, in the post-search filtering only, we see how we filter search results by relevant criteria next after we search for specific content. So we run a search, we search for specific content, not, and, and then after that we filter our results by relevant criteria. So the truth is that you can use either the pre-filtered search or post-search filtering only approach. But as this chart illustrates, you'll spend more time filtering through more results right here with the post-search approach. The major point is that thinking about the sources of information will yield fewer results and give you a higher level of confidence in the information you find. So here, you start with a source of information and you end up with fewer results. Here you end up with more results to filter through, and here you end up with less results to filter through. Um, in my my uh, on the Sloan book, <clears throat> excuse me, on page twenty eight, she uh, writes this this statement that I think is um, very poignant, I guess, in terms of the topic. Indeed, a savvy researcher may know exactly what type of legal authority governs an issue, such as a state statute, and might not want to bother sifting through other types of information. Conversely, if you're not sure which source of information to use, you could miss some relevant material altogether if you focus too narrowly on a particular source to the exclusion of others. So this is illustrating the first sentence of that. Uh, you might know. I'm going to find this in a statute. This, I have a high degree of confidence that 
cases, for example, in our torter battery, um, we'll have we'll likely have what I need. There was a medium degree of confidence in our in our matrix, but uh, this is illustrating that I start by with that initial condition of the source, and that would be the the pre-filter of the relevant source that falls into this category or this area of the pyramid. And then I search for the content and I can filter the results by the relevant criteria, by what it says, what, it's, what, what I find, and then evaluate those search results in a more, um, and it'll take me less time. I'll spend less time there. Um, here we search for the specific content. Uh, and then we say, oh, okay, well, you know, here's the, here's the content. This is what I know I need to find. This is the, the tort of battery content. Here I find my search results. I have, you know, cases. I have statutes in front of me now. I have regulations maybe in front of me. Um, it depends on what I, what that unfiltered search result says or brings to me. And then I have to look more at the different um, filters again instead of doing it at this point. And then here we have to evaluate our search results. My personal opinion is that novice researchers are better off investing the time needed to ground their research in the sources of authority that are more likely to govern the issue. And that would be a pre pre filtered search. And um, as you improve your understanding of the sources of law and how they govern specific types of problems or not, your pre-search and post-search filtering will come natural. And But this takes time and practice. So let's apply this. First, I will address the particular hands-on exercise for chapters 5 and 6 in a separate lecture, but I don't want to leave you in a lurch or confused about this process. So I want to note that the Westlaw hands-on exercise for chapters 5 and 6 will illustrate the use of Westlaw Next and how to narrow search results with a pre- and a post-search filtering process. You're going to do both a pre-search process and a post-search type of process. You'll also benefit from the Westlaw Next training module called Fundamentals of Westlaw Next Patron Access because that's going to lay the groundwork to help you navigate Westlaw. It, and it's, it's an absolute prerequisite to actually performing the hands-on exercise for chapter five and, chapters 5 and 6. Trust me, you'll understand. Um, you have to know where you're going when you get into that um, Westlaw and not just bounce around from place to place and try to intuitively figure it out. You can do that, but it's going to be an inefficient use of your time without doing the um, hands-on, I'm sorry, without doing the uh, fundamentals of Westlaw Next Patron Access training module. All right. So assume you're ready to research a legal question or issue and you haven't decided whether to use Westlaw Next or something else as a research tool. These general categories of um, these excuse me, my phone just went off. These general categories of research tools are available to the research researcher and there are considerations that affect which tools you choose for any given research task. On pages 35 through 36, there's some insight from the author of our book as to the main considerations. What I want to add is that, the, is that Westlaw Next has the capability of doing research with or without pre-search filtering. So that's good, depending on where you, um, how much time you want to spend, like those pyramids we're illustrating, in the, um, in the stages illustrated in those pyramids. For example, do I want to search for specific content or am I going to just let the results appear in front of me and I'm going to uh, post post filter, I guess, post filter the results. 
Um, but you know the effectiveness in both the period and mid charts I've already discussed, and and uh, they're also discussed more in Chapter Four. The different um, search techniques that you use will also depend on the available tools. I mean, print research techniques are this filtering process is all the same, whether you're using print or electronic resources. But print, fee-based, electronic resources, etc., they have different um, they have they have different advantages and disadvantages to their tools. On like I point out on pages 35 through 36, there's some insight on the from the author of the book as to the main considerations to keep in mind when you're when you're saying I'm selecting a research tool which one of these four should I use? So read pages, those pages of the textbook to, to improve your understanding. All right, so search techniques available. So now we're saying, how do I approach this research from the standpoint of, um, you know, and again, you know, the Westlaw Next hands-on exercises will more fully develop this understanding. But these three techniques are performed in Westlaw Next. And both the exercises and the fundamentals uh, training module that I've um, assigned are going to apply these common search techniques. And the first one is called citation. We can receive, retrieve a document just by typing the citation of it into Westlaw next. Or you can type the citation of it into Google or whatever. Um, it's an important technique though. I recommend you take a chance at it uh, of using this method. Um, pick out a case from one of your textbooks from your from your one of your program classes that you've taken with the paralegal program. And you'll find almost all of them. I'm sure every one of them has a citation to a case or a summary of a case. And all you need to do is go into Westlaw Next and type the citation in the search bar. The document itself will educate you so that you can expand your search into other sources effectively. And the document will likely cite other legal authorities, which you can read to expand your search. And many legal authorities include research notes, and these are written by editors of the publisher, such as West Publishing. And these editorials can guide you toward other useful information. Um, so it's, it's almost like using a secondary source, if you think of it in terms of technique. If you go to a secondary source like restatements, um, you would, you would, you're guided to more information. And of course, this is based on, um, especially if you type in a citation of a case, in that case, they're going to the the court will have cited to previously decided cases in making in reaching its analysis, and as a result of that, you're looking at precedent about the same topic. All right, uh, word searching. Word searching. In, you know, we all know the information age has led all of us as researchers of any you know. Just researching a recipe, for example, from like chapter one or two of this book, you know, we're we're gravitating a lot toward executing word searches, and word searches take the form of either of both natural language or Boolean logic searches, and the decision of using word searching depends on the factual situation you're researching. For example, the Sloan textbook. Uh, notes that word searching is helpful for fact-specific research to get information about your client's situation or when the applicable legal concepts are relatively unique. For example, researching negligence per se, she mentions. That's a well-known doctrine, doctrine, legal doctrine. But word searching can retrieve irrelevant information as well, and it can retrieve too much information. The example on page 37 of the textbook uh, where she, uh, where the author, Amy Sloan, in, uh, discusses using the word complaint as an example. Now, the word complaint is both a term of art, legally speaking, and a common everyday word. And so this, uh, this example is good to, a good example of how pre-search filtering in t determining the appropriate source will eliminate some of the post-search results. 
For example, if I'm researching the word complaint on a procedural level, I would confine my search to legal uh, for to rules of procedure instead of and possibly statutes uh, instead of beginning with case law. Although case law might come in to my second, if I I might have to reiterate my search, which is common. It's not a it's not a you're not a finished researcher until you realized from other research on the same on your same topic of the other sources that might apply. I can't tell you how many times I've done searches and said, "Oh, wow, it looks to me like I better check the, you know, Florida Rules of Civil Procedure also." Or, "Wow, here is a case about uh, this this statute. The editorial information is referring me to a statute um, or from a statute to a case that interprets the statute." So I better look at that case also to get a full picture of this whole situation that I'm trying to research about. Um, so finding the appropriate source will help to eliminate, eliminate some of the post-search results. And you can read more about this topic on page 37 of the textbook. Uh, a natural language search is a literal search. And the research tool you're using, and obviously natural language is an electronic research tool or research technique, um, and, and it identifies documents containing the precise terms in your research, in your search. But unlike terms and connectors, which are Boolean uh, logic, people, you know, either term works, terms and co connectors and Boolean mean the same thing. Um, and I'm going to discuss that in the next slide. A natural language search does not require you to, to specify the relationships among the terms. Instead, a natural language search uses embedded rules from the, from the uh, tool, the people who develop the tool, the research tool, for example, Google or Westlaw, they embed rules that evaluate the relationships among the search terms for you. And then it, it uses that to determine which documents meet the search criteria. A natural language search, for example, for ice cream sundae that the author illustrates in the textbook, will retrieve documents that contain all or some of those terms, and it'll rank those terms by relevance. Documents which the search terms appear frequently or close together end up being ranked higher than the documents that contain only one of the search terms. In other words, when your search appears before you on your computer screen or your iPad or whatever you use for um, electronic device, um, your list will, with natural language, will retrieve the documents and sort them, and they'll sort them according to the rules that the tool has um, defined, previously defined. As such, it's very important to know how the tool you are using as previously is going to search it, uh, is going to rank the documents. All right. Other each, it, it's just going to depend, and you can you can learn this by looking at their. Um, information pages in Westlaw Next. That information is um, not exactly sure actually, but you can probably find it uh, a help page on that in Westlaw Next. Um, okay, so that's citation and word search. We've covered those two. What about subject search? And again, subject is akin to our matrix that we looked at earlier. What subject search the, um, is it's about using words and synonyms that all help to define the legal problem. And one of the best places we learned in the when there was nothing but print resources was a table of contents or index to a publication. And if you pick up in one of the classrooms a statute book, You'll see in the front of that statute book there's a table of contents. You'll see in the sixth in the volume six of that set of statutes, because there are six 
books in it, you'll see a general index. Just like your textbook, the front of it has a table of contents and the back of it has, a, has an index. These, this is a way of searching by subject. Uh, some electronic services, on the other hand, provide access to table of contents or indexes of selected publication, and you can use those in the same way you use print sources. It didn't used to be the case. In fact, um, it was only until recently that I, when I started preparing to teach this class, that I realized that Westlaw Next has added subject indexes to their uh, statutes. So now in Westlaw Next, you can use the indexes of both state and federal statutes. And I've included a tutorial from YouTube that you will want to view when you get a chance. Um, I'll be revisiting the topic of researching statutes. But the subject search is very useful. And the main reason it's so useful is that without going from source to source, in other words, um, when I run a search in Westlaw and it's sorted by source, like statutes or regulations or, sta or uh, cases, I can go from subject to subject in terms of the source subjects, or when I look at an index, I can see that there are new terms that I had not thought of before. Um, you know, abandonment, let's say. I'm researching and I'm using the word abandonment. I might look to, when I look in the index to statutes, I might find some subtopic subjects about abandonment that I had not thought of. And the, so the index is like, it's an outstanding research tool. And this is why we use the index so much in the classrooms, because it is, it is useful to helping you understand that subjects can sort of morph, or you can find new understanding and new ideas, new synonyms, and uh, new words for your continued search. And go in uh, the, the table of contents, is a little less um, formidable because the topics are very larger and are more broad and general. However, that's also a good way to broaden your search scope when you can't find something with the more narrow scope available to the index. Um, in addition, uh, you'll learn in the Westlaw Next training module titled Fundamentals of Westlaw Next Patron Access that Westlaw Next sorts the research results by subject and by source. That's what I was iterating just a moment ago, where when you run a search and you look in the left-hand column, and this is in the techniques um, in the fundamentals uh, training, that, wow, that search I just did show, has, has categorized all these different sources into their own little, I guess, you know, com compartment of statutes or regulations or secondary sources. Uh, so Westlaw Next is like really amazing. I'm glad we're doing things to make sure students have more um, opportunity to use it. Okay, so moving on. Get a look at the concept of terms and connectors. These are useful as, a, as an initial uh, search strategy when you want to control the relationships among the terms. Because Westlaw Next has advanced filtering that you're going to learn about in the fundamentals um, module, uh, training module in Westlaw, um, it allows this, the advanced filtering allows you to execute a narrowing search within the initial uh, search terms and connectors. I'm sorry, within the initial search terms using connectors and terms. And uh, that's required. You have to know terms and connectors in order to narrow your search results. So what I did was I posted a link to a YouTube video from Westlaw Next and it will help you learn more about how to use search terms and connectors. And like I pointed out, the Fundamentals of Westlaw Patron Access Training Module in Westlaw includes some very relevant guidance to see how you filter, filter a search using terms and connectors. You can start your initial search using terms and connectors. Or you can start your initial search using natural language. Um, but to narrow your search in Westlaw, 
because maybe you came up with too many results, you're going to be required to understand terms and connectors. An important point that the author makes, Amy Sloan, in her 2014 book, our textbook, about terms and connectors on a very general letter le level when you're dealing with uh, conducting computer-assisted research. The research tool you decide to use for your research may treat terms and connectors differently. Google may treat terms and connectors differently from Westlaw Next, and the two of them may treat them differently than Lexis Academic. Why is this important? Because the order the tool assigns to the terms and connectors um, will result in your search results will depend on the order that they assign to the terms and connectors. Um, and so it will it affects the ranking as I have previously noted. In addition, things like that we use for expanders, um, such as the asterisk or the exclamation point are used differently in different um, search tools. So Westlaw, Next, and Google may use a different type of expander. And an expander, for clarification, is when um, I use an asterisk or an exclamation point, depending on what the tool requires or how the tool reads that, uh, to substitute for a variable word, variable word endings. For example, our case scenario, uh, a research question involves smoke. If I write the word smoke or I type the word smoke into my um, search bar, I, and I put an exclamation or an asterisk, as the case may be, depending on my tool, that acts as an expander at the end of the word, and then that means the research tool, Google, Westlaw Next, whatever I'm using, would also look for smoked, smoker, and smoking in addition to smoke. So textbook uh, pages 40 to 42 describes the order of processing and how that can affect your search results and the use of expanders. In other words, whether you should keep reading further down in your results or if you may have been found, or if the way you used your terms and connectors and your expanders um, will rank the highest on one research tool or the lower on another. All right, so that this is, um, except for the reference page to come, um, that is everything I wanted to cover on chapter five. And again, recognize the overlap between uh, chapter 4 and 5, they really should be uh, examined together. Recognize that pre-search filtering is a um, very good method and it helps you to start thinking about sources that you should consult to narrow your results in the first place. In other words, when you, when you define your sources, the results of the initial search will have fewer results than when you don't. Now, you don't have to define your, your sources in a pre-search filtering criteria like the pyramids were showing, but what I'm going to end up with there is a lot of results. And that might be okay if I know that I'm probably going to find the results in, for example, statutes anyway. Then I would just go by subject on the left-hand column in Westlaw, for example, and say, oh, I, I'm looking for statutes anyway. I can ignore the um, containers with with um, rules and regulations or secondary sources because I'm pretty. I have a super high level of confidence in what I'm doing, but that is going to take practice, and um, your background knowledge is going to also dictate a lot of this, just like with the pre-search strategies. Okay, so thank you very much. There are the references.